so much for joining us today. We currently have over 270 people registered to join us throughout the day. Uh, 80% of those are uh, patients. The remainder are healthcare providers, uh, caregivers, uh, physicians and professionals. So we want to thank you all for joining us and uh, give a little quick um, shout out to the people that are joining us worldwide from Ireland, Greece, Canada, India, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and Israel. So uh, uh, we're going global today, and that is really, really exciting for the American Sleep Apnea Association. As you can see, our goal here and our mission is to improve the lives of sleep apnea patients. And whether we are able to see you in person at our summits or have something online like this, um, we feel that we can get that community connection going. So I'll let Adam go ahead with the next slide. So at the core of it all, as the American Sleep Apnea Association and sleepapnea.org, where uh, most people enter our, our community and our, and our, and our uh, channels, we are patient-driven. We are patients at the core, uh, as Justine so eloquently said earlier, 80% uh, of the registrants for today's virtual Wake Summit meeting during this COVID era are, are patients. Uh, so not only patient-run and led by an all-patient board, uh, we're patient-centered. Uh, we've had our, our hands in, 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 in the tech-savvy world as far as from the devices and looking at CPAP data all the way to the consumer devices and a four-year ongoing sleep house study we did uh, with the Apple Research Kit that just we just wound down uh, this past month. Um, the data for that study will be available with Sage Bio Networks in July uh, for qualified researchers to look at. Um, at the same time as we're doing some of this groundbreaking mobile uh, research, we are now very much education focused, which is brings us to where we're at today, our AWAKE program. AWAKE is the acronym Alert, Well, and Keeping Energetic. Uh, considering that the world has changed and we're now in a COVID era uh, and we are all confined one way or another, whether by ourselves in a solitary uh, um, domicile or with our family, or if, if we have to be a frontline essential worker. And we're gonna have a lot of different doctors from all over the world, uh, hopefully frontline reporting from Italy, uh, from the state of Washington with Dr. Vittiello. Um, we are gonna find out what is going on about COVID um, from, a, from the patients asking the questions. Um, and once we sort of identify the biggest 800 pound elephant in the room, we're going to start to look at the potential research that we probably should start to prioritize going down the road. And then what are the outcomes most important for our community? Uh, we can't touch on everything today, uh, but this is a start. Bear with us. It's all virtual. Uh, so everyone's connecting from all over the world. And uh, we're happy to have you all here. I like to, I always say this is Friday and it's Friday night live. It's Friday afternoon live, uh, but we're awake live. Um, coming from the front lines of Italy, state of Washington, and all over. And what it amounts to is this is really our opportunity to learn from a crisis. Um, and as patients that have been sitting home and have been socially isolated, uh, we have some of the most world-renowned experts. Um, and you'll be seeing in the first panel coming up, we'll be led off by Dr. Professor Maurice Ohayan from Stanford Sleep Epidemiology Research Center is going to help guide us through to make sense of all this data that we are hearing about on the media, in the paper, online, and uh, see if we can start to make sense of it and what it means for us today and tomorrow going forward, since this appears to be a marathon. So I just, uh, I'll take this opportunity just to uh, talk a little bit about some of our current initiatives that maybe you have participated in or have seen in the past. And if you haven't, maybe this will be the opportunity for you to, um, you know, move forward with us uh, and engage that way. You know, with education and awareness, we do have uh, our Awake Network, uh, which includes the, the summit, our uh, Facebook groups, our online forum. Uh, we have implemented a weekly speaker series uh, within the past month or so. Hopefully, you've been able to uh, watch those with the physicians and experts that we've been able to have. And uh, this coming fall, we will have the uh, annual Sleep Timber campaign coming up. Um, in regards to um, advocacy, uh, we still have our interaction with the FDA. I had mentioned earlier in 2018, we had uh, our um, 
awake meeting uh, PFMPD uh, with both the device and pharma side of the FDA. Before you start throwing uh, out throwing out acronyms, Justine, PFMPD means Patient Focused Medical Product Development. We were the first disease that the FDA actually brought CEDAR, the pharmaceutical side, their division together with the device side to look at our disease to realize that we aren't so siloed that we're looking at this disease because uh, we're mixing and matching all these interventions. Sorry to interrupt. No, I, I appreciate it because I realized I said it and then I couldn't remember what it meant. So <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you came in for, for that. And um, and we are uh, still engaged with the FDA in their patient caregiver connection program. So um in regards to research, I'll let Adam talk a little bit about, about that and give a quick update on the Sleep Health app, which he had mentioned just a couple seconds ago, and then our uh, Otuverlap study with uh, the COPD Foundation. So when, when, when we've been talking to our doctors online for the last few months uh, with some of our awake speaker series, uh, we find out that when patients show up to the hospital, they're, they're labeled as PUI, patient under investigation. Uh, and that's really what we're doing today. We're going to sort of do a, an overall investigation of the consequences of confinement on our population in this era. Uh, we have done it in a pilot format with a, with a mobile study with the Apple Research Kit for the last four years, but that is what I like to call pre-COVID. Uh, we've done it with uh, um, being an advisor and working with Dr. Sai Parthasarathy at the University of Arizona and his Peer Buddies program that he's done uh, in Arizona, we're trying to work with PCORI to be able to scale that nationally so we can train peer-to-peer -peer mentors all over the country, because uh, unfortunately, now that we're seeing in this COVID era, uh, the support, the education, and the hand-holding for our cognitively impaired patients is uh, falling off the radar. Uh, one of those programs that we've been running for the last few years is the CPAP Assistance Program, uh, which in light of the COVID era, uh, we had patients and, and family members were, were, were sending us gently used and old machines because they're most likely uh, infected with the virus, we no longer accepting them. However, we are offering our Awake Angels program, which we uh, brought out of retirement after a couple of years ago during the, the hurricanes in, in, in Texas. And actually, Dr. Swick was one of the beneficiaries of that, who you'll hear from later on from Takeda Pharmaceutical. Um, and our Awake Angels is very simple, is that people can make donations to sleepapnea.org and they can help provide replacement factory sealed masks for our patients that can't afford them. Right now, we have a lot of patients furloughed. We have a lot of patients, obviously, on unemployment. We have a lot of patients that don't have insurance that are underinsured that can't afford their premium. So the most important thing we can do for those that are at home right now is make sure that they have access to their resupplies. Uh, so come to sleepapnea.org, visit our CPAP assistance program, and see that if you need resupply mask, uh, CPAP masks, that we have them there for you. Um, and that's sort of, you know, we've helped over 7,000 individual patients get a full, full machine and mask hookup over the last few years, and we're proud of that. Uh, but we know, obviously, right now in this day and age, there's, there's a major need for machines and masks, and, and anything we can do to get them out to our patients is... is, is what we want to do. Uh, looking ahead for our organization, uh, as Adam mentioned, we are um, this year, 2020, uh, increasing our virtual assistance options that, that we had. We'll talk a little bit more about that later today. We have some new education materials coming out uh, um, in, uh, during uh, September and September of this year. We are really uh, making a full effort to continue to build our community and uh, give you the resources that you need and then also be able to provide you with some um, opportunities for impactful research. Um, Adam, before I tell everybody about the chat and Q&A, is there anything else that you would like to say? I just, wanted, I, I just wanted to let people know that we're going to be focusing on the consequences of the depression that we're dealing with, the anxiety, the disorientation, the cognitive decline, uh, Dr. Vitiello is going to be talking about the perspective from uh, the geriatric community and what's going on and what he's seeing in his backyard. Uh, and if, we, if we're lucky enough to get Dr. Palazzi reporting directly from Italy and Bologna, uh, we'll be able to ask him about what's going on with all this new pediatric uh, stories. But with that, I would love and I'm honored and humbled uh, to introduce 
Go ahead, Justine. Sorry, before before you introduce your your, your next group, I just wanted to speak directly to our attendees um, and tell you that um, if you have uh, down on the bottom of your screen, you have a chat function and a, and a Q and A function, and uh, I will be monitoring the Q and A function for the panels. And so after the experts and individual speak. If you would like uh, me to review those questions and post them to the, the expert speakers, please put them in the Q&A. Um, the chat function enables you to speak to the panelists or to other attendees. Um, we do have a lot of our staff in there as attendees to help you with some questions. Um, there's a lot going on, so I'll try my best if you pose a question to the panelists in chat to answer, but um, I'll just leave it at that. I'm going to try my best. Uh, it's a it's a it's a new Zoom world, and and uh, we're excited to have everybody here today. And uh, so, thank you for your patience, and thank you for your understanding of as we all work through this together. So, uh, with that, I'll let Adam go ahead and get ready for the uh, for the first talk. As they say, the show must go on, and. Uh we were always scheduled to have our summit today, and we've, this is our third annual, and we've, this is now, we've, we've done one in D.C., we did one in the Presidio in San Francisco last year, and this year we're lucky enough to have Dr. Professor Maurice Ohayan from the Stanford Sleep Epidemiology Research Center come and moderate and help us lead and understand what is going on with all the information that we are getting out there from all the different channels now that everyone is home and confined and isolated and somewhat disoriented. And, and uh, you'll see as we go through today, even this new sort of virtual world of doing uh, webinars when everyone's not in the same room. It's one thing to broadcast out. It's another to try to get everyone to connect with, with their high-speed uh, connections and bandwidth and things of that nature. Um, Dr. O'Hayan is going to moderate the, the panel, and uh, Dr. Michael Vittiello from the University of Washington, who's a specialist in psychiatry and the geriatric uh, world, will be joining us to give us a first-hand account from the state of Washington. And if we're lucky enough to get Dr. Giuseppe Plazzi from the uh, University of Bologna in Italy to, to log in, we'll be able to get a firsthand account of what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Plazzi, to the best of our knowledge, as of last night, uh, there's been some relapses in Italy and might have been called away. So um, if we're lucky to get him, it'll be great. If not, we can always touch base with him post-meeting. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend, uh, a mentor, and someone who's been a great guide. Uh, for sleepapnea.org and the American Sleep Apnea Association since last summer uh, with the, the, the passing of the baton and the torch from Dr. Christian Gimeno. Um, Professor O'Hayan is a, is a, is a, where, has a lot of skills and uh, brings a lot of worldly and global knowledge as an MD, as a PhD, as a statistician, as an informatician, as a behavioral expert, uh, and will be able to help us make sense of our sleep, our sleep apnea, the sleep quality, and what this confinement is doing to us right now and how we best can adjust to it going forward. So with that, welcome Dr. O'Hayan. Welcome and thank you very much for your welcome and for the introduction of our discussion. Uh, like you said, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the problem uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Plazzi that presently is uh, held by the emergency uh, a room uh, in uh, Italy, and uh, maybe he will join us. I uh, uh, I wish uh, have to have his presence, but presently we have Dr. Vitiello with us, and uh, Professor Vitiello is uh, uh, professor at the University of uh, Washington and uh, Seattle, and uh, he is professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and he will speak with us. Uh, about the consequence of confinement. Confinement is one of the most important elements that is for sure appearing with the COVID epidemic. And uh, the consequence on the sleep, on uh, mental health are really very important. And uh, I hope to see Michael Vitello joining us. Uh, er first, uh, Michael, around you, in uh, the state of Washington and in Seattle in particular. What uh, are you s seeing presently? Oh, well, uh, we are a microcosm of, uh, of the United States and of course of the world. Uh, we were 
the first identifiable case, at least for the moment identifiable case, appeared here in Seattle, uh, actually at a, at a long-term care and nursing home facility. So um, the geriatric population has been particularly affected by this. As uh, people who've been following this know, uh, most of the deaths, actually, in New York, for example, uh, have been in long-term care and uh, community facilities. And I don't just mean nursing homes for uh, older adults, but all of the congregate living facilities that uh, that older adults uh, tend to use, whether it be a retirement facility or a continuous care facility that goes from independent living to uh, nursing home facilities, are being severely impacted. Um, there's a count in King County that we are uh, seeing COVID cases, and I think it's over 200 of these facilities now, and there have been a considerable number of deaths. Uh, the problem that we're all experiencing with confinement, I think, is particularly acute in uh, the older population for a number of reasons. Uh, many of them are in confinement in small units in these homes, uh, and they've lost really all the indicators, the social indicators, the uh, temporal indicators that allow for normal life, uh, you know. Maurice, you, you alluded to the relationship between sleep and mental health. Well, both mental health and uh, sleep rely on good circadian rhythms. And you have a weakening of the circadian rhythm in older adults anyway. And when you take away the normal cues, uh, the ability to get out of your apartment, to exercise, to eat at a regular time, uh, all of these things are being impacted severely and probably are adding to the burden uh, on, on individuals. In individuals that are compromised uh, with some cognitive compromise, they may be exacerbating that compromise. Uh, and as a result, you get this kind of, if you will, spiraling of poor sleep, uh, inability to cope, uh, poor response to the stress of confinement, which further exacerbates things, makes sleep somewhat worse. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's a difficult situation, uh, and do do you see uh, consequences on the sleep duration and the sleepiness of these elderly people? To be honest, we don't have that data yet. Uh, you know, this is an emerging problem, and uh, I'm only seeing it not from a research point of view or even a, uh, an extensive clinical point of view, uh, but simply can infer it from what we know about how sleep responds. Uh, to perturbations, uh, that in all probability, what we're going to see uh, is people have more opportunity to sleep because they're locked in their homes, uh, and that there's probably going to be a, a breakdown in the circadian phase of sleep, that is a principal sleep period, and you'll probably see people doing napping uh, and fragmenting their sleep, which we know is not a healthy response. Yeah, and, but uh, in terms of uh, sleepiness, in terms of uh, sleep duration, oversleeping, uh, do you see some uh, some consequences that you, you you are afraid to see appearing in this population? Well, I can't say directly, but but yes, I mean, if you, we know that uh, that severe changes in sleep increase the likelihood of morbidities and mortality. Uh, it may be that we're going to see additional burden added onto these people. I don't know what the direct effects would be on, say, sleep apnea per se, um, but uh, if people are uh, sleeping more and out of circadian phase and with fragmentation, uh, you can increase their uh, risk of daytime functional limitations, increased risk of falls. Uh, all, of these fo all of these things follow when sleep is significantly disturbed. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the institution, do you have some uh, return from uh, institution for elderly people? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't follow that question. Yeah, is uh, do you have some uh, uh, feedback from uh, institution of our elderly people in the region of uh, Seattle? Ah, um, well, to a degree, I mean, I can't speak to individuals. I have some experience with some of these. Uh, group living situations. And I know that they are trying to do the best they can uh, with their elderly residents. Uh, 
Um, and, and it varies tremendously. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that uh, although we've seen a lot of uh, COVID uh, morbidity in uh, lower socioeconomic status people, uh, this is not a respecter of, uh, of uh, economic status in older populations. Even some of the most uh, elaborately funded and high, well-heeled uh, independent living facilities in Seattle have seen COVID cases and indeed deaths where uh, some of the more middle of the road have not. So uh, let, let me ask, Sorry, let me ask Adam. you, let me ask you a question, doctor is, is I know on the West coast, you know, there, you know, there's, a, I guess a different sense and sensibility as far as are, are they sending those elderly or geriatric or, or long-term care patients back to the homes with the virus there well, are uh, a well, lot of that going on the East Coast, obviously. <laughs> yes, certainly. When the lockdown began, uh, people were, it was explained that uh, for most people, they were expected to hunker in, hunker down in place. Uh, pe- families had the option of bringing their elderly home if they wanted to, but the vast majority, in certainly in independent living situations, uh, have stayed in place. But what you have is a situation where you have congregate living, you have people that are uh, isolated into their individual units, but are still being exposed, if you will, to the staff. And, uh, you know, and these, and if I may speak about risk, these are the young people that we're now seeing go to the bars <laughs> in states that are opening and not socially distancing and not wearing masks and interacting uh, very closely. And quite honestly, they're going to be the ones that communicate these diseases, uh, this disease, if you will, to the older populations. Uh, and that's the thing that people don't recognize. It's not if you're 20, you take the attitude, well, nobody dies when you're 20. No, but you're potentially spreading it to the people that uh, may, uh, may die and have much greater risk. Yeah, I guess as a behavioralist, I think we're going to learn a lot about uh, what what's really going to happen now with uh, you know the young voters, uh, the young kids who whether they show up to vote, do they care anymore? Uh, do they you know there's, there's there's some of the negative connotations going on with this is the, the so-called baby boomer disease, but we're seeing it doesn't discriminate uh, what shape or size or or what what socioeconomic background you're from or even what country you're from. Oh, yeah. And we've seen that in uh, some of our political leadership who've expressed uh, an attitude of, well, they're kind of old anyway, and they've got illnesses, so what the heck? Mm-hmm. But it's yeah. a very different thing when it's your family member. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you see a, a surge of uh, mental health uh, problem in uh, this population, uh, consequently uh, uh, with uh, confinement? Well, you're going to see increases in anxiety. Uh, You may see increases in depression. It's going to vary uh, from individual to individual. But I think if if we're able to do population surveys, uh, we would see much more situational anxiety and depression, uh, especially given the nature of how we know confinement works. I, I hate to use a crude analogy, but we use solitary confinement as a punishment in the prison systems. Well, we've effectively enforced this to a greater or lesser degree on everyone in our culture. And it's one thing to be confined in a family unit. It's another thing to be uh, an older adult or an older couple that are then isolated from everything they know. And all I can say is um, heaven bless our technology because, um, you know, a lot of these facilities that I'm talking about, one of the upsides is they're trying to facilitate social connection with their populations by making available these kinds of technologies, even if the older individual doesn't have one, that they can provide iPads that are linked to Zoom and linked to the other um, the other social media that allow for at least some contact, even if it's only virtual. Yeah, I think that is a way also to fight this uh, sleepiness that must uh, be a uh, present uh, inactivity in all these institutions is to put the people in contact, also virtual contact, and to fight this uh, is- mental isolation. Because in fact, the confinement at the end with the elderly population is uh, going on 
the mental isolation of uh, the people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, there's a total breakdown in the social and environmental cues that allow us to maintain regular good quality sleep. Uh, e you know, even meals. Let me give you the example of meals. We don't think of that as a zeitgeber, as a timekeeper that helps maintain our Uh, circadian rhythms and and therefore inform good sleep, but it is one of the multiple factors. Just, it's just that light is the most powerful. Well, you're now less likely to go out and get light. You are getting meals uh, not at the normal standard times that you've typically experienced them, but at times that the facility can provide meals because they're not set up to go around and drop trays off in all of these house, in all of these units, but that's what they have to do. So some days you'll get your lunch at 11, some days you'll get your lunch at two, the same thing for your dinner. So you're getting this wide variability in all of these social cues. You can't go out and exercise, so you're not getting as much light. Um, you know, you're not regularly doing the things that you do. And they can't do group activities. So all of the activities that used to be organized, now you have to worry about social distancing or masking or whether we can do them. And these things will change over time as this becomes, I hate to say it, but a more, I won't say normal, but uh, more that we become more experienced with it and we have more uh, practice at it. Uh, but uh, if we don't continue to do these things, uh, uh, we will see even greater morbidity and mortality in the older population. Yeah, I'd be remiss to say, I mean, we're all from working from home. That's why we don't have masks on. But I'm sure as, as two gentlemen of science that you, you're the first to put on your mask when you go outside the door, uh, knowing that you got to protect yourself, but also those around us. And this behavioral change alone is, 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 is it's, it's going to be a... The, It's not the new normal. This is what we have to do to adapt to this new world we're in. Yeah. Well, well it's as uh, Dr. Fauci suggested. He thinks that handshakes should cease. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, to continue on that, uh, one of the biggest consequences of our elderly people is also the fact that they are isolated from their grandchildren. Children are not uh, Uh, going uh, with them, they are more isolated from their family, and uh, all of that, I suppose, have a big impact on uh, their mental uh, uh, ability because they are really isolated. The, the interactions are minimal. Also in the institution, I suppose that the restriction in Canada must be uh, as uh, bad as we, what we have here in America, very severe. Yeah, in Canada, actually, yeah, they are in lockdown. Uh, there's been some significant differences that I don't fully understand in Canada, but Quebec has been particularly hit, uh, whereas most of the rest of the Canadian provinces have not been. Uh, it may have something to do with the social structure in the French Canadian uh, yeah. population, that they uh, interacted more often and more intimately and uh, more rapidly. Uh, well, you spent time in Canada, Maurice. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. is why I was referring, because this morning I was speaking about this situation for the elderly people, and that is uh, really a, a big preoccupation because they are really totally isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the same situation in France. You have the same situation in Italy. And uh, sure that... Uh, Um, I, I, I am sorry to do not have with us uh, our friend uh, uh, Giuseppe Plazzi that could have uh, spoken about the situation in Italy that seems to, to go again uh, uh, not so good. It seems uh, that the number of cases are suddenly increasing again for Bologna uh, at, at least. Yeah, well... I am, as you know, not an epidemiologist, but I, I do know enough to be dangerous. And the uh, approach that's being taken across the United States is guaranteeing us, guaranteeing us resurgence in, in this virus and another massive wave of morbidity and mortality. There, there is no way it will not happen. Mm -hmm. Even though I, I'm happy to report that in King County, my county today, for the first time in two months, we have no reported COVID deaths. First time. Usually wow. we've had 10 to 15 reported daily. But 
our trajectory is down. But how long, we, how long have you been at a stay at home? We've been, County? we've been, we've been, we are now in our ninth week. Nice. So we've, we started early and we didn't start quite as early as many, but we've started early and we've maintained fairly good control. Um, and as a result, we've managed to, um, to blunt the curve and we're on a slight, somewhat downward trend. Uh, New York is similar. A number of the states are similar, but you know when we hear that the nation has flattened the curve, that is not true. I repeat, that is not true. The reason we see the flattened curve is because the states, such as my own in New York, that have succeeded in somewhat wrestling with this beast, uh, have artificially modified the curve. Because if you take us out of the equation, uh, most of the rest of the country is on an upswing and has not yet experienced the top of their surge. I, I wanted to remind some of our attendees and, and guests that are, that are joining us today. I know that I see some questions in the chat. Uh, it's easier if you post your questions in the Q&A function on the bottom footer of the, of the, of the Zoom browser. Uh, and I did see one, one, one mention that, came, that, that really, I think, lays a you know, some groundwork to what you're talking about, Dr. Vitiello, and that's that Quebec and border, Quebec is on the border of New York. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that this was transmitted one way or the other across borders, or, or I think now that if you're seeing recurrence in some of these hospitals, it makes sense that these young kids are the ones that are suffering it from it the most and then going out. It's a possibility, uh, but uh, Ottawa is also on the border from New York, and so we don't see the same thing in the neighboring province just to the left, uh, which is uh, a different uh, ethnic background, for example. Ah. The, the, bulk, the bulk of the people. Ottawa is a much more, uh, quote, British, classic British-Canadian population, and Quebec is really French-Canadian, and they are different, very different cultures. Um, it would be interesting to see if, if Montreal uh, is experiencing similar rates uh, to Quebec City, uh, two mm. cities that are, that are quite different with Montreal being more metropolitan. Quebec well, City well, being one of our uh, ongoing, One of our ongoing patients and awake leaders, his name's Kevin Bradley. He's going to be on our frontline panel uh, on the, the second or third panel. Uh, and he's, uh, he's actually a transport, transplant coordinator nurse in Toronto. So he'll be able to give us firsthand because he's basically his job has gone to completely COVID, you know, working on the COVID teams, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the normal world mm -hmm. before is not operating. So I'm sure Kevin will be able to speak to that uh, on that panel. But Adam, you do raise a, an important point, which is borders. Viruses know no borders. And so it does not matter that Washington and California and Oregon have, uh, have somewhat mastered the beast currently, because as soon as people come in from other states that are carriers, uh, we will uh, likely experience new flare-ups. And I'd be remiss to say, and I'm, and I meant to say this in the opening, you know, it's, 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 we've almost become numb to the world we're living in the last few years because of the 24 seven. And now that we're confined, but you know, we haven't even acknowledged in this, in this country or started to grieve for the 86 or the 80, what, 80 plus thousand that, that we already know that have passed, let alone, we know that's on the horizon. I mean, we haven't even started to deal with that. Uh, from an emotional standpoint, so we're, we have people at home. They're confined. They're separated from their loved ones and their and their end of life. Uh, I mean, all the normal societal routines and things that all the safeguards are gone. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, this is this is a, a psychological tragedy in the sense that people get no sucker when they're dying, uh, other than nurses garbed in you know incredible protective gear. Uh, and then uh, the families can't uh, attend a funeral. Uh, we're doing mass graves. I mean, realistically, you know, we have bodies stacked up in refrigerator trucks until they can be buried without ceremony. Uh, and then we have families that are left with uh, nothing of the standard grieving processes. Uh, and then when you speak to the numbers, 80,000, the current number, or slightly above, is undoubtedly a lower estimate and we haven't even reached the top of the curve yet so we can anticipate at least doubling that at least doubling that and again i, I this is not epidemiology this is logic 101 mm -hmm. thank you so uh, 
uh, we were looking at this uh, consequence, but uh, for sleep per se, mm -hmm. uh, for the elderly people, because in fact, what is happening is that sleep apnea has uh, also is maximum peak with uh, uh, old adults, with people over 50. So do you see a, a surge, something uh, happening there? Uh, don't know, but it, it does raise an interesting question. I mean, we know about all of these risk factors, uh, but I haven't heard any reports, and I don't know if it's been examined, as to whether apnea per se, you know, apneic patients per se are at greater risk. Uh, you know, it, it interacts with obesity, uh, it interacts with age, uh, but is it a, an individual risk factor? I mean, given that it's pulmonary in nature, at least to a degree, uh, does that give COVID, uh, you know, a little extra leverage? Uh, as in terms of confinement's impact on sleep apnea, I quite honestly do not know. Yeah, we have uh, presently, we are... Uh, too early. I suppose that the data are collected. I am sure that the data are collected. Our center also is trying to collect this data, but it's too early. Nothing sure. is uh, uh, analyzed. Nothing uh, uh, is really uh, uh, on its way to be published or to be uh, uh, correlated with other uh, research. Everything yeah. is uh, uh, on ongoing. Well, it's going to be uh, an interesting exercise to tease out because of the uh, the cross correlations <laughs> between mor between the other morbidities. I mean, if you know, if you look at it, uh, obesity, if you look at metabolic syndrome, uh, if you look at uh, apnea, the, there are relationships amongst those, and then you add COVID on top of that. So. Uh, being able to parse it out as an, individual, as an independent risk factor is going to uh, take some work, Maurice, the I, kind I, that, you, that you do. I, I think that's the beauty, and 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 if you're looking to be an optimist, and in, in, in light of this terrible debacle, is that that that's the crisis, and that's the opportunity that this has presented us, is to sort of finally answer all these correlation causation questions, chicken or egg, uh, because it's it's affecting people, whether it's the heart, the, 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 uh, the edema, the encephalitis, the respiratory, the autoimmune, wh whatever the, the reaction that, that people are manifesting, as yeah. we, when we learn back, at it, it's got to be some sort of sleep component, sleep the breathing component. Yeah, and we haven't even touched on the idea that uh, poor sleep can change immune function and uh, increase inflammation. And so if you have poor sleep and you've got compromised immune function, does that put you at greater risk if you're COVID exposed? All of these are, are profoundly interesting questions. <laughs> it sounds cold, doesn't it? But, uh, but you know, you're right. Uh, if when faced with this severe case of lemons, uh, we need to do what we can to learn from it, uh, certainly so that going forward, we're not as debilitated again. Well, I think that's a sort of a good segue, uh, Maurice, for our, our next sort of uh, discussion, which is really the future of, of where the research goes and, mm -hmm. and where our job as a patient advocacy association is going to go. Because I, I think those questions are really what's happening right now. It's, let's, let's evaluate everything. We're the one chronic disease that seems to overlap with not only all the devices and, and different things that people are using, but also the pharmaceutical interventions and also the behavioral. But also from, a, from a, just a range, it's a, everyone sleeps. There's no, one, uh, <laughs> there's no exclusion criteria. So it is a cradle to grave sort of thing that we do all our lives. So you know, now that people are home and you know, almost, I think I, I saw Governor Cuomo say that he's been doing a, a 75 days. 75 daily briefings. I mean, that's, 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 I mean, we're, we're getting close to three months now. And this is just the first inning. We know it. Yeah. And a, and a tip of the hat from the West Coast to uh, Governor Cuomo. He's been a real wartime leader. So maybe uh, thank you, uh, Michael. We can, uh, I, I suppose, uh, Adam, that uh, uh, we can close uh, the, the discussion saying that, uh, again, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your presence today. Surely. And uh, for... I, I, Chris, Chris uh, Justine, has her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Um, I think it's one of these. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's a question. So ah. You're correct. <laughs> um, we had a few questions come in and... Um, 
they some of them relate to some future topics that we are going to to touch on but i just want to pose them to you to see you know um if if you have anything to to say i think i think the first question from um doug h is uh something that's been coming up a lot in regards to cpap use and that is the question of using the machine and it error um, and so I don't know if, um, if, if either of you feel comfortable talking with that, we do have some other MDs coming later in the day that I could pose the question to, but if there is anything that you, uh, have seen, have heard, have, um, you know, gotten some information on about using a CPAP, you know, at your home with your loved one, your bed partner, taking it to the hospital, if, if, you know, something does happen. Uh, I'm going to beg off as a psychologist and, and let the physicians address that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll get in trouble if I talk about treatment. <laughs> okay, no problem. No problem. I'll hit them up later. I just figured I would ask just because I didn't want Doug to think that I, I didn't see his question and, and wouldn't ask. It's and, an important um, one. It's, our, it, it's an important question, Justine, and something we're going to get to today as far as, as the impact of the CPAPs uh, as, as the primary intervention for, for, for this, for our disease. Uh, and, and, and the benefits and risk about that. We've been doing that ongoing on the speaker series. Uh, it looks like the, 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 there is no definitive answer yet, but I think some of the other doctors are going to have some, uh, their, uh, experienced, um, okay. perspectives on it that, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing an increase in coronary care and cardiac units and cardiac cases because we assume, and we won't know this till later on that people aren't using their CPAP because they've been scared off by it. So Someone, uh, uh, Mohammed actually uh, asked a little bit more about the front line that we'll talk about later, but he had some questions in regards to light therapy mm -hmm. and people that do shift work. Do either of you have a little experience with that? Lots. Um, oh. I, well, shift work, it depends on whether you're considered uh, essential worker, and but most shift work is essential work more often than not. Uh, so those people are continuing uh, to do their shifts, but we do know that shift work is a risk factor for a lot of uh, negative health consequences. So we'll just leave that at that. Uh, light therapy is very useful. Um, yeah, yeah, hold on, doctor. You don't have to be shy about that. We've known that NCI has known for 10 years that, that shift works a direct carcinogen for cancer. Nobody talks about that. Well, no, no. I just, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, I can only, uh, speak to so much. Uh, but uh, if you want to be bold about it, there you go. Adam. Uh, I just wanted to also say that, uh, certainly light, uh, and light boxes can be very useful in, in certain situations, uh, particularly if you are, number one, uh, sensitive to light deprivation in winter and might have something like seasonal affective disorder, and uh, particularly if you're living in higher latitudes like uh, we do up here in Seattle where we have significant uh, seasonal affective disorder, and uh, certainly in Alaska, our colleagues, there's a lot of light therapy that's used up there. Uh, and that's usually used to extend uh, the photo period and to give better timing signals as to when it's appropriate to wake up. And that concludes our first panel on confinement, impact on sleep, sleep apnea, and sleep quality. We'd like to thank our moderator, Professor Maurice Ohayan, and our featured panelist, Michael Vitello. Coming up next is implications on the future of sleep apnea research and advocacy. Please stand by and we'll be ready shortly. Mm -hmm.